today we're going to be taking a look at jaundice as part of the gastroenterology series. As a starting point, we can define jaundice as a condition which involves yellowing of the skin and the sclera of the eyes. And the reason why it happens is that we have a buildup of a compound known as bilirubin, which basically has this yellow-orange tinge to it. When the levels of bilirubin exceed around 35 to 50 micromoles per litre, this results in jaundice becoming visible. If we want to have a good understanding of how jaundice develops, we first have to understand the bilirubin metabolism pathway itself. In essence, bilirubin is produced from the breakdown of red blood cells, and there are a few different stages involved in metabolism which result in the end products being formed. The reason why it's so crucial to understand the fundamentals behind the bilirubin pathway is that it can help to differentiate between the different types of jaundice pathologies. Let's take a look at the first step of the bilirubin pathway, which involves direct red blood cell breakdown. As you may know already, red blood cells have a typical lifespan of around 120 days in the blood before they start to be broken down. As part of this process, the hemoglobin which forms these red blood cells is broken down into heme and globin respectively. The globin molecules are further broken down into amino acids, which can be used to build proteins, while the heme is converted into biliverdin and eventually into unconjugated bilirubin. Now importantly, these unconjugated bilirubin molecules are actually lipid soluble, meaning that they can't dissolve in water or in the blood without being bound to a carrier protein. In this case, these molecules of unconjugated bilirubin bind to albumin, and they're then transferred to the liver, where they're converted into conjugated bilirubin molecules instead. This conjugated bilirubin is water-soluble, meaning that it can dissolve inside the blood without the need for a carrier protein. If we take a closer look at this process, what's actually happening is that we're adding a molecule of glucuronic acid to the unconjugated bilirubin molecules, and this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme known as UGT. From this point, the conjugated bilirubin molecules which are formed are transferred to the gallbladder for storage. And if we were to take a closer look at the gallbladder at this stage, we would see that it would carry multiple bile salts as well as the molecules of conjugated bilirubin. Once the bile is ready for release, these molecules of conjugated bilirubin are transferred via the bile ducts where they reach the duodenum of the small intestine. And this step of release is quite important because it allows the bilirubin to enter the gut for further breakdown. This brings us on to the final stage of the bilirubin pathway which involves gut metabolism itself. The conjugated bilirubin molecules, which are now in the small intestine, are broken down by gut bacteria into a compound known as urobilinogen. And this urobilinogen can have a few different fates. Around 80% of the molecules are converted to stercobilin, which is a dark colored compound that's excreted into the stool, and it's what gives feces its brown color. A further 2% of the molecules are converted to urobilin, which is excreted via the kidneys into the urine. Finally, around 18% of the molecules remain as urobilinogen, and it's reabsorbed back into the blood and eventually back into the liver for further breakdown. Just to show everything in one place, we have a summary diagram of the bilirubin pathway here, and we also have a slide that shows the key products formed at different stages of the process. Now that we have a good understanding of the bilirubin pathway, we can move on to understanding jaundice itself where we have an excess of bilirubin in the blood. We typically divide jaundice into different types depending on which part of the pathway is affected. For example, a prehepatic jaundice involves issues with red blood cell breakdown, a hepatic jaundice involves issues with liver conjugation, and a posthepatic jaundice involves problems with biliary release. And we're going to be taking a look at each of these categories in more detail. Starting with prehepatic jaundice first, this is caused by an excessive breakdown or hemolysis of red blood cells, leading to a buildup of bilirubin in the blood. To illustrate this, we can return to the first step of the bilirubin pathway, and if we have an increase in red blood cell breakdown, anything downstream in this pathway will increase, 
eventually culminating in a huge rise of unconjugated bilirubin molecules. These molecules are transferred to the liver bound to albumin, and the liver has to work overtime to convert the excess to conjugated bilirubin. However, the main difference is that the conjugated bilirubin can still be excreted, so it doesn't rise as much as the unconjugated bilirubin. To summarize this, in a prehepatic jaundice, we get a significant rise in the unconjugated bilirubin levels and a normal or slightly elevated conjugated bilirubin. So what are the possible causes of red blood cell breakdown in a prehepatic jaundice? The causes can actually be divided into the intrinsic hemolysis and extrinsic hemolysis. Looking at intrinsic factors first, this can include abnormalities of the red blood cells, such as sickle cell disease, thalassemia, G6PD deficiency, or hereditary spherocytosis. In all of these cases, there's an issue with the structure of the red blood cells, which results in the body destroying them more quickly than the usual 120 days. Alternatively, there could also be extrinsic hemolysis, and this is where the red blood cells are normal, but there's some sort of external damage. For example, this could occur with autoimmune factors or immune-mediated responses to incorrect blood transfusions or in hemolytic disease of the newborn. In some cases, there might be some level of mechanical damage, and this can occur in a broad range of conditions known as microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. In these instances, the blood vessels become more narrow compared to usual, and the red blood cells end up tearing as they pass across this tight space. Finally, hemolysis could also be caused by specific types of infections or toxins which enter the blood. In terms of the key features of a prehepatic jaundice, the bilirubin levels, as we mentioned, involve a significantly raised unconjugated bilirubin and a mildly raised or normal conjugated bilirubin. As well as this, there might be some abnormalities in other blood test results due to the hemolysis effect. For example, there could be a decrease in the hemoglobin level as well as an increase in the reticulocyte count. This is often associated with a rise in the lactate dehydrogenase level as well, and basically indicates some form of red blood cell depletion. There can also be a decrease in a substance known as haptoglobin, and haptoglobin basically helps to clear free hemoglobin in the blood. So if more red blood cells are being broken down, more haptoglobin is being used up. Finally, in terms of the clinical features, patients with a prehepatic jaundice may develop anemia symptoms, so shortness of breath or fatigue, in addition to splenomegaly in some cases. The urine and the stools of patients are often normal in a prehepatic jaundice because the bilirubin can still enter both the kidneys and the gut appropriately. Let's now take a look at the second type of jaundice, which is a hepatic jaundice, and this typically involves damage or dysfunction within the liver itself. As we mentioned before, unconjugated bilirubin is converted to conjugated bilirubin in the liver. And if we zoom in on the hepatocytes, we can see that they're all working hard to convert the unconjugated form to the more appropriate conjugated form. If we have some type of hepatocellular damage, these cells can become impaired, and we lose the efficiency of appropriate conjugation, resulting in less unconjugated bilirubin being converted by the damaged cells. As a consequence, the levels of unconjugated bilirubin end up building up in the blood. At the same time, there will also be some hepatocytes which carry conjugated bilirubin, having converted it previously. When these cells are damaged, they end up leaking the conjugated bilirubin into the blood as well, where it's picked up on the blood tests. As a result, we also get a rise in the conjugated bilirubin levels in this case. So a hepatic jaundice will involve a mixed picture of increased unconjugated bilirubin and increased conjugated bilirubin in the blood. In terms of the causes of hepatocellular damage, this could be anything which causes injury to hepatocytes. So for example, viral infections, alcoholic liver disease, or autoimmune hepatitis. Some patients might be affected by non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, ischemic hepatitis, 
or particular drugs or toxins, for instance in the case of paracetamol overdoses. Based on all of this, we can see that the key features of hepatic jaundice involve a rise in both the unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin levels. As well as this, there might be some other blood test results which indicate hepatic damage. For example, we often see a significant rise in the AST and ALT enzymes, which are produced by the hepatocytes. In some cases, we might also see prolonged clotting times, such as a prolonged prothrombin time, as well as decreased albumin if the condition is chronic. In terms of the clinical features, patients may have fever, itching, and right upper quadrant pain alongside the jaundice, and in some cases there might be associated hepatomegaly and ascites. Finally, hepatic jaundice often leads to darker urine compared to normal, and this occurs because the conjugated bilirubin, which is water-soluble, backs up into the kidneys, where the orange colour results in darker urine being produced. The reason why the stool is normal is because the conjugated bilirubin can still be excreted into the bile ducts, so the stercobilin is still produced as normal. Now, there are a couple of special cases which don't meet the same clinical picture as the previous examples, and these are termed inherited conjugation defects. If you remember, the process of conjugation involves glucuronic acid being added to unconjugated bilirubin to form the conjugated type, and this reaction is catalyzed by the UGT enzyme. In one of these inherited conditions known as Gilbert syndrome, we have a deficiency in the UGT enzyme, and this means that the unconjugated bilirubin molecules cannot be converted to conjugated bilirubin as efficiently. So, for instance, in this case, you can see that only two out of the four molecules were actually converted to the conjugated type, leading to a buildup in the unconjugated bilirubin levels. Gilbert syndrome is not typically severe, because we still have some activity of the UGT enzyme. However, another example of an inherited conjugation defect is a condition known as Krigelner jar syndrome, and this involves a total absence of the UGT enzyme. In this scenario, none of the unconjugated bilirubin is actually converted to the conjugated type, and as a result, we have a huge buildup in the unconjugated bilirubin levels in the blood. This condition can often be fatal or life-threatening and requires urgent treatment. To summarize the findings of these special cases, if you ever have a situation where there's an isolated rise in the unconjugated bilirubin levels and all of the other bloods, so the conjugated bilirubin and LFTs return normal, it might point towards an inherited conjugation defect instead. Let's now take a look at the third and final type of jaundice, which is a post-hepatic jaundice. And this involves a buildup of the conjugated bilirubin levels in the blood due to a blockage of the bile ducts. Again, we can return to our normal bilirubin pathway, and what normally happens is that the conjugated bilirubin molecules enter the gut via the bile ducts. If we therefore have some level of obstruction of the bile ducts, these molecules of conjugated bilirubin end up backflowing, which increases their concentration in the blood. There can be different types of obstruction, so for example, there could be intrinsic obstruction, caused by gallstones and cholangiocarcinomas, or there could be extrinsic obstruction, which can be caused by pancreatic masses or enlarged lymph nodes. And in these cases, there's some sort of external pressure on the bile ducts, which results in them becoming more narrow and blocked over time. In terms of the key features of a post-hepatic jaundice, the bilirubin levels will involve an isolated rise in the conjugated bilirubin type, while the unconjugated bilirubin will remain normal. And this is because the molecules have already passed through the liver, so there's no issue with the conjugation itself. There might also be some other blood test abnormalities due to the blockage of the bile ducts. So for example, a significant rise in the ALP and GGT enzymes which are found in the cells lining the bile duct. In later stages of the condition, we might also see a rise in the AST and ALT as the bile backflows into the liver. Finally, regarding clinical features, patients with gallstones might complain of right upper quadrant pain, 
while patients with pancreatic malignancies might have a chronic history of weight loss and painless jaundice. Posthepatic jaundice also typically leads to dark urine and pale stools. And the reason why this occurs is because the conjugated bilirubin cannot enter the gut, and it therefore can't be converted to stercobilin, which gives stool its dark colour. At the same time, the conjugated bilirubin, which is water-soluble, ends up backing up into the kidneys, where it's excreted into the urine, and this gives the urine a darker colour compared to usual. To finish off, we have a summary slide here which outlines the key differences between the different types of jaundice pathologies. I hope you found this video helpful, and I'll see you in the next one.